Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part time musician who wants to go full time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. On the Profitable Musician Show, we give you practical tips and strategies to increase the income you're already making and tap into new streams so you can create more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. We also help you think like a business owner so you can keep more of the money that you make. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, author of the best-selling book, The Musician's Profit Path, and host of the popular Profitable Musician Summit. And as you can probably tell, I am obsessed with helping musicians like you to build a rock solid fan base and income foundation so you can fund the music you are driven to create, share your message with the world, and fulfill your God-given purpose as a musician without stressing out about where your next dollar is gonna come from. You've got the talent. You just need the marketing and business tools to take it to the next level. Now let's dive in to the Profitable Musician Show. I'm so excited to be here with Judith Hill. I have followed her for quite a bit, and I really think she has a very cool and interesting career story that I want to share with you guys. Um, Before we get into more specifics, I'd love for you to tell them, Judith, just a little bit about your background. some of the highlights of your career in case they don't know already, and then we can get into some more specific questions. What's up, everybody? This is Judith Hill, and um, yeah, I mean, a little bit about me. I'm born and raised, born in North Hollywood, L.A. girl. Um, I grew up in a very musical family. Both my parents are musicians, um, and they met in a band, so I, I was surrounded early on with music, particularly funk soul music, And um, I went on to study classical music in school, and I got a degree in music composition as a a composer. And um, out of college, you know, I I traveled around the world as a background singer for a bunch of incredible people, and then um, also went on to The Voice uh, as a contestant, and then... um, was featured, my story was featured as one of the stories in the documentary 20 Feet from Stardom and um, went on to um, create my own debut album. And then on my third album, which is going to be released this February. And and since then, I've just been traveling, doing the the circles around the globe with my band touring as as a touring artist. Um, And so, yeah, it's been an incredible ride. Well, how are you navigating with the pandemic as far as the touring? Have you been doing live streaming? (laughs) Yeah, so all my tours got canceled this year. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's definitely a big adjustment because I I made most of my my money from touring. So um, it was a real shock and, and hella scary in the beginning, but I've really pivoted this year and focused more on film and TV and um, done a bunch of, you know, different live stream concerts and as much as you can do as an artist in this environment, you know, um, but yeah, it's it's just been it's been a definite adjustment, challenging, and I'm finding ways to like connect with fans more via social media. Um, of course, I I prefer being out in the real world, but you know I've, we got to make these changes for now. Yeah, I know we don't really have a choice. But um, have you found with the the live streaming that do you prefer to do like ticketed live streaming or do you do a live stream and take donations? Which way do your fans like to support you best? Well, right now I have, I've done like mainly just um, platforms like um, not ticketed, but we are going to do a ticketed show um, coming up. I, I, I have my reservations about a live show in, in the sense of like, um, being on a a stage with no audience. I like it to feel very more intimate. So I've been just doing more type of performances that are uh, in studios and in in the home and things like that. And those, that's the type of like live streaming I've been doing. Mm, That's cool. Well, let's go back to way back. Um, I, I certainly experienced this as someone that came out of college with a music degree. And I know a lot of other people do as well. Like, 
how did you transition from college and having this amazing music background into like, quote, the real world and finding a career? Did you immediately go into singing and, you know, backup singing? Or was there kind of a transition period? How did you find that as kind of your thing out of school? Well, I, I studied, I didn't study um, singing at all in college. I studied as a strict, as a, as a con, uh, composer. Hard to believe. I can't believe yeah. that. <laughs> and so I, I really, I wanted that degree because I was so passionate about music and, and I wanted to have the ability to create anything I want to create musically. And as a singer, I had just all these like influences within me growing up and I wanted to be able to write masterpieces. And so that's why I, I did that degree. But I knew at the gate, um, coming out of college that it was up to me to make of it what I was going to make of it because I was singing, you know, professionally as a kid throughout my life. So I always knew I was going to land in that world. I just I wanted that education for me, particularly for myself. And I wasn't the, the goal wasn't to become a film composer or um, work behind the scenes. It was just to be able to have that for myself, you know? And um, so, yeah, straight out of college, it was more of a um, figuring out, okay, wh what do I do now? How do I, how do, what's my first thing? And, and it was just a very kind of a, a random thing, but I got a call for an audition for um, this French pop star, Michel Polnareff, who was doing his big comeback tour. He's like the Elton John of France. And I auditioned for it and I got the gig as one of his background singers. So that was my real big first rodeo out of college. Wow. That is, that's a pretty lucky first rodeo. That's pretty amazing. And, but had, I'm assuming you had been singing throughout college, even though you didn't get, get a degree in that. Yeah, I was singing throughout college. Um, not as much because it was such an intensive uh, uh, degree. And I was, I lived at, at, on the dorms and I didn't leave it. I just kind of, every once in a while I would jump out for a session, but it was very much like I was living there. I was in the practice rooms. I was writing, you know what I mean? So college wasn't really something where I was doing a lot of singing, but I did do it in high school. I would say I did like, you know, I knew like back then, I knew some of like the vocal contractors that would contract me as a, as a kid singer for like the holiday shows and things like that. So I, I had done some, a little bit of work like in, in high school and junior high. And I think that's really valuable because you saw at a young age, okay, there are jobs out there and this is, you know, how you need to connect with people to get them. I think a lot of people, they don't have that experience. And so then they wonder like these jobs seem very elusive. Like, could I ever right. get a job as a backup singer? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I had seen, I had grown up around all of the background singers. Um, as a kid, I was, I was mentored by many, many people. Uh, so I, I, I knew, I knew what that looked like as a kid. Mm. And so what was it like just starting to go off and, and be on the road and performing as a, a background singer at a young age? Was that like, exciting do you did you feel like you made a lot of great connections that then moved you into other parts of your career because of that yeah so I, I would say my first the fan the French gig which I was at, living in France for a year about a year wow. on that tour it was a long tour um and it was really a chance for me to first of all be outside of America it was like my first time living in another country like that and experiencing life and really figuring out um, what it is that I want to do and, and, and really um, get my feet wet. And so I did a lot of like soul searching and uh, during that time. And when I got off that tour, I came back and um, I immediately started just writing my own music and, and preparing to release my own songs and, and get into that. So that, that was, that was a very good inspiration time for me. Mm. And as you were doing a lot of other background singing, I know you sang backups for Michael Jackson on the This Is It tour, like so many famous people that you've sung backups for. Did you ever feel like that was keeping you from doing your own music? And eventually did you have to just kind of start saying no to those jobs so you could actually focus on your own music? Yeah, well, it's quite interesting because I didn't really um, spend a lot of time doing background singing it's so it's so weird because the stuff I did do was so 
high profile, but short lived. Like we were literally just rehearsing for like a month and a half with Michael Jackson before he tragically died. So it wasn't like I was out here uh, like hustling all, all the years, like as a background singer, it was really just like these short periods and they ended up being like this big thing that people knew about. But then um, I, I mainly spent a lot of my time as an artist. Like after Michael, I spent a year just writing and, um, in the studio for my own solo projects. And then, um, then I became a background singer for Stevie Wonder. And I was in his band for about a year until I decided, like you said, yeah, I, I decided that I needed to, um, this was going to take up most of, I would just enjoy this so much and I probably wouldn't pursue a solo career if I just kept going like this. So I, I decided to go on The Voice and I, I, I left his band for The Voice. And since then, I kind of never looked back on the background singing scene. But I, um, I did, yeah, I did have to make a decision. That was a really tough one because I was so obsessed with Stevie and I loved his, his show so much. It was really hard to leave. I did not want to. But at the same time, I knew that like it was either now or never if I was going to make that you know, transition. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you just have to make the leap. Otherwise, you know, we get into this comfort zone and it's like, we like that thing, right? Yeah. We- it's amazing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard. Um, so once you went on the voice and I remember watching you on that season and again, like I know it, the internet is all says like, you know, Oh, it's one of the most controversial um, you know, person that got voted off at the wrong time and things like that. And I kind of agree with that. But did you, were you able to really capitalize on the the fame that you got from The Voice? It opened up a lot of doors. It definitely did. It was, um, you know, a lot of people watched that show and, and coming out of that show, I got a lot more work. Um, my, um, my fee raised exponentially. Uh, yeah. Like, well, you know, and, um, and like a lot of stuff, yeah, a lot of stuff came out of it. It was, it was actually, you know, it's, I do recommend that type of show. Um, it is, it is kind of cheesy, but at the same time, it, op- it opens up doors and allows people to just get to see you in your element doing your stuff, you know? So I, I, I did enjoy that and I did, a lot came from it. And did you feel like the, the fans that you got on The Voice do you feel like they're still with you now? Have they continued to follow you? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, yeah, my, my journey is a bit unique because um, people, fans are coming from different chapters of my life, but I do find that there are still a lot of people well, after my show, they come up to me and they're like, they're like, oh, I loved you from The Voice. I remember you from The Voice. So, yes, a lot of people are still coming to see me because of that show, which I find amazing because it was like a while ago. But yeah, I mean, that (laughs) it's, yeah, they still come from that show. Well, and I I don't think that that could happen if you didn't continue to nurture them along the way. So obviously you're, you're keeping a pretty tight relationship with your fans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. Now, do you, do you have like a newsletter? Do you send out emails to your fans? Do you have certain things that you do with them on social media? Yeah. And in fact, I'm starting to do that a lot more now. Um, you know, there was a season of a four to five year season that I'm just coming out of where I, I took some time and I didn't have a team, a management team. And I was, I was doing my artist thing, but without that and like, then I, but now that I have like a team again, I'm doing newsletters and I'm a lot more active and stuff. Mm, that's good. Now, how did you get, I know you got some, um, have gotten some licensing opportunities for your music. How did you get into that arena? Um, that is, that all came from my publisher. Um, I'm signed to Concord Music Publishing and they have a kick-ass sync team. Like <laughs> their sync team is the win. It saved me from this year, really. Um, so they have been pitching on, and they get a lot of stuff. They, they really do. Um, it was a Mogum before and then Concord bought a Mogum and like a bunch of other publishing companies and, and, and it really turned into just an, a great, great team. That's awesome. So basically they, those sync royalties have really helped prop you up during the pandemic. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, it's, it's the, it's cause, um, you know, it's a, a good, a good license, you know, when you, when they, when they take your lo- a song and, you know, depending on what the fee is per side, it, it's, it's sometimes it's real, it's a real blessing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. 
So I always love to ask artists about kind of their streams of income because I'm I like to encourage artists to really get different streams of income that will help you during different times. And especially what we just said about the licensing helping you during the pandemic, but let's just say we're not in a pandemic. What, what is your, what are your streams of income look like? Like what would you say the percentage of your income comes from live performing or merch or sync? I would say before 2020, I would say that, um, I would say that like maybe 60 to 70% came from touring and like, you know, um, 20 came from sync or there's like merchants in like digital stream platform and stuff that too. But I would say more came from sync this year. It's like flipped. It's like, it's all sync now. Um, a little bit from the, the streaming and digital, but mainly, um, and also from like requests, like, um whether it be like I, I have like other things that i work on like um projects for other companies like branding companies and things like that that um also uh are different kinds of income that's great uh, have you seen this year that your streaming income has gone up significantly or at least have you seen a lot more people streaming your music because they're home yeah yeah they have and and i think also because um I've done some like television shows this, this year where a song, a few songs have done really well that were just, uh, they brought traffic to my whole, um, my whole catalog, like little fires everywhere. I did a cover for the Phil Collins in the air. And then I did a thing with Jared way for the umbrella Academy. And so wow. those were kind of things that, um, people were able to look at because they really loved those songs. And then, once they did that, they listened to the rest of my catalog on Spotify. So it helps. Mm. It helps with everything else. Yeah, that's one thing I really love about Spotify is if people listen to anything of yours, they're going to start serving your stuff up to them in their Discover Weekly. And then yeah, when your sure. album comes out, you know, they're going to send out things to them about your new songs. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a really important point of why we need to be building our Spotify streams because of the fact that we can utilize that. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's see. Is there anything else I want to ask you? I would really love to know if you have any advice, especially for young women coming up in the industry. Do you have any advice for them on how they can get started building the relationships that they need to get their career off the ground? Um, yeah, I think it's just um, figuring out um, – what it is that you really want to do and focus on. Like for me, I knew I really wanted to perform, which is, you know, why I, I've been focused on, on that and, and then getting some really good booking agencies that will make sure I stay on stages. But then, you know, making the discovery that there's money to be made in the sync world and other ways um, was eye-opening to me. But I think it's it comes with like first the passion, but then also being open to, other things and, um, and just trying out all the avenues. I think that like, um, don't be closed minded, but be open to everything. And, um, and just, just keep building, keep be staying, staying in people's, um, ears, you know, that sometimes people forget and you have to follow up with them and, and then send a couple more emails and then they're like, Oh yeah. And then, you know, it takes a little bit of persistence to, to networking and getting into people's minds and, and following up and, um, and yeah, just trying out something. There's so many different ways now. It's not just one track. Um, there's just so many things flying at us in this new world. So just being open to all of it and learning, constantly learning. I'm, I'm learning every day. There's this new information that's coming out about everything, you know? Mm. Yeah, I think always be learning is, is so important. Um, one thing I do like to ask everybody is, was there ever a time that you felt like quitting as an artist and you know, what made you stick with it? Was there anything that you learned through that difficult time? Yeah, I think I always, there's feelings, I get that a lot, but I think that what I always remember for me personally is I never, music was never, um, I never jumped into music because of commerce. I, I, it was something that was like this 
spiritual calling that I knew I had in my life and something as a human being that while we're here on this planet, we're the, we're the, the storytellers. We're the ones that give voice to the human experience. And so when you really look at it from like a higher calling, um, then it, it, it can give you the strength to get you through the highs and the lows of it because it's going to be, you're going to get, you're going to be some times where you're like, you don't know where the next check is coming. And you're like, Oh my God, this month, you know what I mean? And then some, some days where you're really grateful, like things are rolling in, but you know, all of that's very just sobering because it's, it's not a business that is stable um, as much as other places. So you just got to have that real conviction within you of like, like I don't, mind doing I, I know what I'm doing this and the money isn't going to stop me from not doing it mm. yeah oh well that's that's great advice and yeah most people that I ask that question to they're like yeah pretty much every day I've thought about quitting <laughs> but, yeah 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 you know. for sure I mean it's tough it's no it's not for the faint of heart I mean especially this year it's like man you know <laughs> it, and you're right it is a roller coaster sometimes so you have oh, to yeah. you know the highs and the lows hopefully even out and you have to remember the highs when you're in the lows. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Wow. Um, well, this has really been very, um, I love, I've loved hearing about your career. And I think that everything that you've talked about has been super inspirational for up and coming artists and artists that are already out there. Um, how can they connect with you on social media? Uh, yeah, you could follow me on Instagram, Judith Glory Hill, Twitter, Judith underscore Hill. My website is up, Facebook, and I'm constantly like doing stuff. I'm doing like weekly live, live events on, on Instagram and giving away stuff for free. So yeah, just check it out and love to connect with everybody. And when is your new album dropping? February, second week of February. Oh my goodness. Okay, well, this is yeah. going to come out right around that time. I don't have the exact date yet. So oh, maybe cool try to coincide it perfectly with the release of that album, which will be exciting. Awesome. Yay. And tell them like, what's the name of the album? The name of the album is baby. I'm Hollywood. Oh, love it. <laughs> love it. Especially since you were born in Hollywood. That's uh -huh. great. Love it. All right. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today and sharing all your wisdom and experience with our listeners. For sure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.